All right, welcome to part two of our gap lectures. Again, these gap lectures are covering 1789 to 1877. This is the stuff you should have covered in eighth grade, um, but we are doing a brief review, as brief as I can possibly make it. Um, this is part two, so we're covering 1860 to 1865, the years of the Civil War. Um, so last time we covered the presidencies, um, from 1789 up to 1860, right? And we covered that gap using those presidential terms, looking at the presidents, looking at major changes under them. Um, and we left off with Buchanan. Um, and I told you that Buchanan is unequivocally uh, ranked last on most, if not all, major presidential ranking systems. Um, and and this is why. Uh we, are, we come to the election of 1860, and the nation is absolutely divided. The southern states have already said that if Abraham Lincoln is elected, uh, they will uh, strongly consider seceding, which means to leave the Union, right? Um, and in fact, the election of 1860 is so hotly contested because Lincoln isn't even on the ballot in the southern states. And so what we're going to see is that Buchanan, in office, basically gave up. He knew he wasn't going to get reelected. Uh, he knew that, um, really, he had failed at doing anything productive. And so he just sat back and watched it happen. And so now here we are in 1860, and we have the presidential election of 1860. And as you can see here, there are four people running. Uh, representing the, the Republican Party is Abraham Lincoln. And remember, this is not the Republican Party that you know today. Uh, very, very different parties. The Republican Party, as I mentioned last time, is made up of a, it's, it's a coalition party, meaning that it's, it's pieces from other parties come together to form this new party. It's free soilers who are opposed to slavery, again, because it takes jobs away from poor white men. They have no moral, uh, no moral uh, problem with slavery. They don't find anything wrong with the institution and the enslavement of black people. They simply think it takes jobs away from poor white people, and they'd rather see those manual labor jobs go to poor white people. You have... Uh, anti-slavery Whigs and Democrats who have left their party to join this coalition uh, known as the Republican Party. And then you also have nativists, people who, again, they are anti-immigrant, they are anti-slavery because they don't believe that black people, uh, you know, they weren't born here or they weren't originally from here, um, which is an interesting argument considering that our entire nation is, is a nation of immigrants come from uh, England and uh, the Netherlands and other places like that, but that's an argument for another time. So this is the Republican Party that Lincoln represents. Lincoln himself, uh, early in his career, is a free soiler. Lincoln, personally, uh, does not believe that the president has the authority to end slavery. So when Lincoln runs, uh, he runs on the Republican ticket. And again, I've just explained to you the Republican platform. Many of those pieces of the Republican platform are anti-slavery, not because they think it's wrong, but because it takes jobs and whatnot. So Lincoln is part of this party, but Lincoln is up front several times throughout the election that he doesn't believe the president has the authority under the Constitution to do anything about slavery. And so it's really this interesting battle because these other uh, men running – um, are going to vehemently oppose the ending of slavery. And they are going to paint Lincoln as this anti-slavery crusader, this abolitionist, and yet Lincoln himself in his own writings, in his own speeches, uh, again, early on, especially in 1860, Lincoln is not saying that he would get rid of slavery. He is saying he has no constitutional authority to do so. It's a state's issue. If states want to get rid of it, that's up to them. But he as president would have no authority to do so. The other members running in the 1860 election are uh, James Breckinridge running for the Southern Democrats. The You have uh, the Constitutional Union Party. And then you have uh, the Northern Democrats. And these Northern Democrats are the ones that are, the, 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 this is where we get the Lincoln-Douglas debates, right? Douglas is the, the candidate for the Northern Democrats, and this is where Lincoln's major fight is. 
What ends up happening is that, again, Lincoln is not even on the ballot in the southern states. Lincoln is only on the ballot in northern states. But Douglas loses votes because these other parties, the Constitutional Union Party and the Southern Democrats, they take votes away from the Democratic uh, Party, the Northern Democrats. They take votes away from them. They split the party. They split the ticket, if you will. And so Lincoln ends up winning the election. If you look at that, that chart, right, Lincoln only gets 40% of the popular vote. He doesn't even win a majority. He has a simple plurality, a plurality here meaning just at least one more than the other guy, right? Um, he has 40% of the popular vote, and he's not even on the ballot in half the states. In the Electoral College, he wins uh, with 59% of the Electoral College vote, right? He gets to the, the magic number. He gets over it. He gets to 180. Um, so he wins the election that way. But if... If you take those numbers, if, if the Constitutional Union Party and the Southern Democrats under Breckinridge, right, if they aren't in this race, if it's just Lincoln versus Douglas, those Southern Democrat votes and those Constitutional Union votes more than likely go to Douglas. And if you do some simple math there, you will see it is it is by it's not hard to see that Douglas would have won this election. He would have won the popular vote, and he certainly would have taken the electoral vote had those other two not been in the race. But Lincoln wins. Lincoln becomes president. Again, the election's in November, and by December 20th, 1860, South Carolina announces that it is seceding from the Union. The election of Lincoln was the last straw. They are seceding. They announce, again, you see the headline there in the Charleston Mercury, that the Union is dissolved, right? This this leftover issue of nullification, right, that we saw earlier, we saw it under Adams, we saw it under Jackson, right, this idea that the states retain their independence, that they are voluntarily joining this union, right? We talked about federalism, and again, to, to if you're in South Carolina, to be able to, to make this statement that you have the right to secede, what you are saying is that under a federal system where power is split between the national government and the states, what you, ha what you have to believe if you're a South Carolinian is that the states retain their right to pull out, that they have more authority under a federal system. The states have more power than the national government, right? And this is where, by and large, the argument gets made that this was a war about states' rights. It was a war about federalism and where true power rested. And you could take that look. You could, you could take that stance. You could look at it that way. But to be blunt and to make no uh, ifs, ands, or buts about it, you would be wrong. Because the South Carolinians themselves said this. This is directly from their Articles of Secession. It says, a geographical line has been drawn across the Union, and all, all the states north of that line have united in the election of a man to the high office of President of the United States, talking about Lincoln, whose opinions and purposes are hostile to slavery. He has declared that the governments cannot endure permanently half slave and half free, and that the public mind must rest in the belief that slavery is in the course of ultimate extinction. They go on to write, this has been aided in some of the states by elevating to citizenship persons who, by the supreme law of the land, are incapable of becoming citizens, and their votes have been used to inaugurate a new policy hostile to the South and destructive of its beliefs and safety. On the fourth day of March next, this party will take possession of the government. It has announced that the South shall be excluded from the common territory, that the judi judicial tribunal shall be made sectional, and that a war must be waged against slavery until it shall cease throughout the United States. That is wor that is, that's a direct quote from their Articles of Secession, published on the uh, 20th of December of 1860. It makes no, uh, it leaves no room for question. They are not challenging federalism. They are here saying that the issue of slavery has divided this nation, that under this new president, under this new Republican government, 
right? That's when when they say this the party will take possession of the government, they mean the Republicans, right? On the on the fourth day of March, that's when the when Lincoln will get inaugurated, that they have waged this war against slavery, um, and and simply put, the South Carolinians will not accept that. If you don't believe that, if that's not enough to convince you, because apparently it's not enough to convince major portions of our nation today, if that wasn't enough, here are the articles of secession from Mississippi, where they say our position is thoroughly identified with the institution of slavery, the greatest material interest of the world, right? Virginia, the federal government having perverted said powers not only to the injury of the people of Virginia, but to the oppression of the southern slaveholding states. Now, therefore, we, the people of Virginia, do declare and ordain that the union between the state of Virginia and the states under the Constitution aforesaid is hereby dissolved. They made no uh, secret of it. They kept they, – they made it wasn't a question. The southern states seceded because of slavery this institution of slavery. A lot of them refer to it as a domestic institution. If you read the rest of the secession uh, uh, declarations, a lot of them will say that the union now finds itself opposed to the southern domestic institution, uh, a pe the peculiar institution, as many writers would refer to slavery. But by February of 1861, South Carolina, Mississippi, Florida, Alabama, Georgia, Louisiana, and Texas have seceded, they have declared their secession, again, stating in no uncertain terms that it is because of slavery. None of them are writing this nonsense that it's uh, a state's rights issue. That is a, that is a post-war reconstruction era uh, argument that is a, an argument that we will get to in our next lecture. But none of them in 1860 and 1861 are making this argument. They are all very clear that it is the issue of slavery. And they come together to form, in 1861, the Confederate States of America. They, they elect this man here, Jefferson Davis, to be the president of their new Confederated States of America. They draft their own constitution, which is uh, ripped directly from the Constitution of the United States. They just make sure that they use language that is much more uh, clear on slavery. We looked at the Constitution. I, I got on my soapbox and told you that forever, for the rest of our history, you will never be able to buy an American constitution that does not explicitly say that slavery is part of this nation. It is forever a stain on our country. There's no ifs, ands, or buts about it. And yet as clear as our constitution is, the, the constitution of the Confederate States of America is even more clear that this, this institution shall not be infringed upon. And thus it begins, right? We now have this issue. Can a state truly secede? Can they truly tell the federal government that they are leaving? And, 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 and what is the appropriate response? Lincoln, before he even takes office, is faced with this issue of how to respond. And so before we get into the actual war, let's just take a moment and look. If we are, we are now having a north-south crisis, right? The south has seceded, so let's look at them. The population in the north is far larger. They, the north has the south beat in terms of population. The north also has the south beat in terms of industrialization. Most manufacturing, most finished products are made in the northern portion of this country. Um, what that means is that the southern uh, states now, they lack industry. They are pre predominantly an agrarian society. They are growing crops, and they are not making their own products. They're sending their cotton up north, and that cotton is getting processed and turned into cloth. They're sending their uh, foodstuffs up north, and the, up north it's getting sent out from there, right? The south is far behind in, in, in industry. They also lag behind in population. But what the south has is the south has a will to fight. They have declared this uh, secession. They have declared themselves free, and they have uh, the, the desire to defend what it is that they are 
wanting to defend, in this case, the institution of slavery. And they also know that for them, it's a defensive battle, right? They are not seeking to go attack the North. They're not trying to take new territory in the North. Uh, they know that they're on defense, that if the Union wants them back, the Union has to come get them, right? So they are going to be fighting on their home turf. They know this, right? For those of you that are athletes, uh, you know defending your home court, def defending your home field, home field advantage is a thing. And the South knows this. The South knows that, that they have the home field advantage and they're ready. And the South also knows that they have the superior superior military leaders uh, as, opposed, as compared to the Union. Many of the generals uh, teaching uh, and, and, and uh, leading at the um, major uh, military training outlets like Annapolis, uh, they they leave they they stay with the South right and the South believes that they have a moral conviction a moral uh, high ground that they are defending and so that leads us to April 1861 and Fort Sumter Fort Sumter is uh, a small um, island fort off of the coast of North Carolina okay um, it is. It is deeply in the south, right? North Carolina, South Carolina, uh, these, these waters are deeply in Confederate territory, um, but Fort Sumter is a Union fort. Major Anderson is in control of the fort, and he writes to Lincoln to let them know that they are being surrounded and blockaded. Lincoln uh, is worried about what to do. Lincoln doesn't know what to do, so he does nothing for three weeks. And in those three weeks, the Confederate forces continue to surround uh, to surround Fort Sumter. They block any shipments. They don't allow uh, any food. They don't allow anything to be brought into Fort Sumter. They've laid siege to Fort Sumter. Finally, after three weeks, Lincoln uh, issues orders for military supply ships uh, without military supplies. Right. So he, all he is trying to do is he's just trying to send food, medicine, basic necessities like that to the people at Fort Sumter. He is not trying to send them weapons. He's not trying to send uh, any sort of ammunition. Uh, he is simply trying to get them their uh, necessities. But Jefferson Davis, president of the Confederacy, interprets this as an act of war. Why? It's, it's Union warships entering Confederate waters as he sees them, right? He sees, again, you, we have to get our minds wrapped around that when they declare secession, when they declare themselves an in, independent, and when they form and establish this new government, the Confederate States of America, we now have a separate nation. They are an enemy. They are a foreign enemy, right? So, how would we respond today if, let's say, Great Britain sent a ship, a military vessel, if they entered our waters with without permission, without authorization? We would probably flip out. Right. And we would probably send our military to re to respond. And that's what Jefferson Davis does. Jefferson Davis says, you've entered my waters. Uh, so, you know what? Here we go. April 12th, 1861, uh, the Confederate forces are given the order to fire on Fort Sumter. And by April 14th, Major Anderson is forced to surrender. They, they have no uh, ability to defend themselves any longer. He's forced to surrender. Uh, and on April 15th, Lincoln proclaims that this insurrection is underway, right? Um, they start firing on April 12th. It takes Lincoln three days to recognize that this is actually happening. Um, and on April 15th, Lincoln finally declares that, that this insurrection or war is underway. When he does this, he calls for troops. And we're going to take a look at what he does in a moment. But immediately, Arkansas, Tennessee, North Carolina, and Virginia secede. Immediately, those, those four states also secede, join the Confederacy, and here's where we're at. Okay, The war has started, and now the war is going to be a battle of two different theaters. Right, The war has started. There is no question about it. But now this war is going to take on some unique characteristics based on where they're at. In the Western theater, which would be west of the Appalachian Mountains, if you remember when we talked about uh, the French and Indian War, right, that territory that England won, 
was on the other side of the Appalachian Mountains, right? So we're talking about in the in this war west of the Appalachians. So taking place in places like uh, portions of Tennessee, over into Texas, those areas, right? Um, this is where the Union, again, meaning the North, is going to see most of its success early on. Um, once they take land, once they claim territory west of the Appalachians, the Union does not lose it. Okay, so the Union is very successful west of the Appalachians. East of the Appalachians, in the original 13 colonies and such, right, it's very different. The battle is mostly taking place between two cap between the two capitals, so in, in Washington, D.C., and then uh, Charleston and Richmond, the Confederate capital moves. Um, but basically, this war is happening primarily within this 100-mile radius. And the war in the east is a bloody stalemate until the very last year of the war. It's a back-and-forth battle, high death toll. And again, like I mentioned, the Confederates are focused on defense. They are not trying to take new territories, right? It is, it is a more expensive endeavor. It is a harder endeavor in war to not only win battles, but then to take land. Because once you take land, you have to defend it. The Confederates are not, ha are not trying to push into the Union. They're not trying to take land away from the Union. They are simply trying to play defense. Meanwhile, the Union is having to not only win battles, but then they're having to fortify the territory they take, defend it, and not lose it, right? They are trying to take back this territory. And so the, the Confederates are able to really just focus on defense, which makes this war, which is what really makes this war a bloody stalemate, as we'll see in a moment, um, because by the numbers, it should not have been. In 1861, there were some expectations about this war. In April, Lincoln, again, in response to Fort Sumter, Lincoln calls for 75,000 troops to sign up for 90 days. He, they sign up. Today, if you sign up for the military, you usually sign up for like a four-year active duty contract plus time after in the reserves. Uh, Lincoln calls for people to sign up for, for 90 days. He is convinced this is going to be a short war. Both sides are convinced this is going to be a short war. The Confederates are banking on the fact that they have the superior fighting power. Again, the most of the the well-respected generals of the time uh, cast their lots with the Confederates. They stay and fight for the Confederacy. Um, as we'll take a look at, Robert E. Lee uh, is in charge for the majority of the time for the Confederates. From the time Virginia finally secedes, uh, Robert E. Lee is put in charge, uh, eventually becomes the Supreme Commander for the Confederate forces, um, and he is in charge the majority of the war. The Union goes through general after general after general. Uh, and again, the Confederates, are they, they anticipated this. They, they figured they had the better leadership, they had the better uh, fighters. So again, the Confederate thinks they're going to win this quickly because they have the better fighting force. Lincoln thinks they're going to win this quickly because they have the, better, the bigger population. Um, and the reality is that by our best estimate, 750,000 people are going to die uh, by the end of this war. It's 2% of the population of 1860, uh, and, and everyone is touched by death. Everyone either knows somebody uh, or is related to somebody who dies in this conflict, and it's going to cost roughly $20 billion uh, in damages, $20 billion of lost assets uh, by 1860 currency. Okay, If we adjusted for inflation today, this would be in the trillions of dollars. And again, neither side had any historical uh, example to go off of. The devastation that they're going to see, we're, in this lecture, we're not able to really dive into individual battles, but the death, the death toll starts rising rather quickly. And the only example that they have of this in history is the Battle of Waterloo. Battle of Waterloo uh, saw 50,000 casualties, 
right? This is under Napoleon. Uh, 50,000 casualties, so that's 50,000 people dead, injured, or missing in action. It's a very defining moment in, in that war. It's a turning point in the war. Waterloo is a turning point uh, where Napoleon is now going to be repelled after that. And so what confuses Americans is that there were so many Waterloos, if you will, in the Civil War. They weren't used to this. And none of these Waterloos, if you will, were actually turning points. The Battle of Antietam, they saw 23,000 casualties. Gettysburg, 50,000 casualties. The Seven Days Battles, 29,000. Second Bull Run, 19,000. Fredericksburg, 16,000 dead. Murfreesboro, 18,000 dead, injured or missing. These massive numbers of casualties are something that they have no uh, concept for. They're not prepared for this. There's nothing that they could have studied to, to get ready to, to see these kinds of uh, devastation, right? Even the revolution, we didn't see these numbers. The War of 1812, we didn't see these numbers. Certainly the War with Mexico, we did not see these numbers. And so neither side is fully prepared to, to deal with this. The public is certainly not prepared to deal with this. As the, as the public receives reports throughout the war, they don't know what to do. Neither side knows how to react. But they keep, they keep fighting and they keep going. On paper, the Union had several advantages. Number one, population, like I said. Number two, their industrial capacity, as we talked about. The third one is railroad track, right? On paper, if you look at the amount, the number of uh, miles of railroad track that was already laid in the Union, uh, they had as they far outnumbered the, the Confederacy. And the railroads key. That's how you sh that's how you move troops. That's how you move supplies overland, right? Gone are the days of the horse. And carriage, right, you now are using this iron horse to move your goods and move your men quickly and efficiently, right? If you're needing to resupply your men on the western side of the Appalachians, you are reliant on these railroad cars to get your men and get your supplies there quickly. The Union also has the advantage in weapons production. Again, most of these manufacturing, most of these production type businesses are in the north. They're not in the south. The south was reliant upon their agrarian uh, rural economy. The Union also has a two to one advantage over the Confederacy in food production. Most of what they're growing in the south is not actually for food consumption. Most of what they're growing in the south, as we've as you hopefully uh, studied in eighth grade, is cotton and tobacco. They are reliant on other food crops coming into them from the northern states. The other advantage that the Union has is they have an established government. This government's been around for a while, right? Since 1787, it's now 18, in the, we're now in the 1860s, we're almost a century in, right? And they, this government's been around, they know how it works, the Congress is established, the, un the Confederacy is having to build this government. They're having to bring in senators. They're having to elect these representatives. They're having to establish themselves while they're fighting versus the Union who has their government established. And the major advantage that the Union has is Lincoln. If the South has the superior generals and the superior fighting force, the Union has the superior president. Jefferson Davis uh, is a weak leader. He's a corrupt leader. Much like Andrew Jackson, he is he is prone to hiring his friends and political supporters as opposed to uh, the best and the brightest in their fields. Jefferson Davis is a weak leader by all stretches of uh, the imagination. And historians today point to this as a major uh, flaw. Jefferson Davis could not control uh, his generals. He couldn't control the, the Congress, and it hurts him. But on the flip side of that, the Confederacy had advantages of its own. The, the Confederacy had 750,000 square miles of territory that, that they were defending, right? And so again, we've talked about this idea of offense versus defense. 
the Confederates are playing defense on 750,000 square miles. The Union it has to control, has to regain control of 750,000 square miles, right? So the Confederates have a lot of room to work in, right? If they lose a couple square miles here or there, they're okay. They, they have plenty of territory. They just have to stay alive. They don't have to produce an occupying force. They just have to stay alive long enough to wear down the Union, right? And again, they're fighting at home. We've talked about this, this, this idea of home court or home field advantage, right? They're fighting in their own backyards, right? And this is a major morale boost for them. Um, we've also talked about, again, already the military leaders. And so the bottom line here is when experts and historians look at the facts on paper, right? This war was either sides to win. And so what we want to look at is why then does the Union win, right? And it comes down to a few factors. So number one is the mobilization of an army, right? Raising an army. The Confederates uh, are made up of 20% compelled fighters, meaning that they were uh, they were conscripted by a draft, right? 20% of the Confederate fighting force is uh, drafted. This is under the Confederate Conscription Acts of April of 1862, October of 62, and February of 64, versus the Union, which is only 8% compelled, uh, the, which under the Enrollment Act of March of 1863. Um, the, the Confederate fighting force is mostly made up of people forced into fighting. The Union uh, only has to compel 8%, and this is a major uh, advantage to the Union because again if you're the Confederacy and you're having to compel 20% to fight that means that not only are you having to raise one-fifth of your army from uh, less than willing participants you're having to train one-fifth of your fighting force uh, who were previously unwilling participants men who either did not want to fight didn't know how to fight probably weren't very uh, healthy or capable of fighting, you're now having to take one-fifth of your entire fighting force and compel them to serve and train them, whereas the Union is under 10% having to do that. Uh, we're also going to see the suspension of civil liberties both in the Union and in the South. Uh, Lincoln suspends a lot of constitutional authority, uh, suspends a lot of constitutional protections, particularly around uh, the rights of the accused when it comes to uh, capturing uh, Confederate territories and what to do with prisoners of war. Um, but we also see this idea of taxation, right? August of 1861, we see the first income tax in US history. Uh, we see the first income tax issued again to fund this war but the union can do that the union has the population to collect these taxes from the confederates don't we also see uh this this issue of slavery and emancipation come forward and this is where i want to spend some time uh Again, this war, when it started, the Confederates come right out and say this is a war about slavery. Lincoln and the Union come out and say, no, we are here to get you back. Lincoln, again, is convinced he has no constitutional authority to do anything about slavery. And so slavery is not on the table for the Union until May of 1861. And this is where we're going to break down kind of a common um, folklore in American history. Many people will tell you that uh, Lincoln freed the slaves. Many people will, will today, again, uh, wrongly claim that the Republican Party is the party of Lincoln, right? Uh, and Lincoln freed the slaves. And this, is, this could not be further from the truth. The reality is that Lincoln did not make slavery the issue. The people who made slavery the issue were slaves themselves. May 1861, Fortress Monroe, it's a Union fortress. Early that morning, uh, Shepard Mallory, Frank Baker, and James Townsend, they are slaves whose master has just been appointed a colonel in the Confederate Army. They find out, they flee the plantation, they flee to Fortress Monroe, and they begin begging for asylum. And the question arrives. The question arise, arises of what should the U.S. Army do with runaway slaves that flee to Union lines? Benjamin Butler, 
who is no friend of the slave. He, he hates abolitionists. He hates uh, the Republicans. Right. He supported the Dred Scott decision, but he hates secession more. He thinks it's treason. So he joins the Union Army. He takes con command of Fortress Monroe one day before uh, Mallory Baker and Townsend arrive at Fortress Monroe. The very first day he's on the job, he is faced with this issue. What happens? when runaway slaves make their way to Union lines. And so he interviews the runaways, and he decides not to return them to their master. Now, written into the Constitution, fortified later on through several uh, decisions, is this idea of fugitive slave uh, laws. And, and the idea that if a, a slave runs away, you are obligated under the law to return them to their master. But Benjamin Butler decides he's not going to do it. And he reasons that they would be – that these slaves, if they were left in the control of their master, if they were returned to their master, they would be put into the service of the rebel cause. And because they would become rebel soldiers, or, or at least they would become uh, – part of the rebel cause, he reasoned that he had a, a, a military obligation or a, a military power to not return them. And so when the Confederate officer uh, who owned these slaves, when he arrives to Fortress Monroe and he tells Butler, return my slaves, uh, Butler emphatically tells him the fugitive slave law does not apply to foreign combatants and foreign enemies. He says that you have declared yourself an enemy nation. Uh, therefore, fugitive slave laws only apply to the Union. You are not part of the Union. I don't have to return your slaves. But he says that if, uh, if the officer wants to uh, keep uh, – wants to declare his, his uh, faithfulness to the Union, if he'd like to defect – in other words, from the Confederacy. If right then and there he would like to declare his allegiance to the Union, then he would be very happy to return his slaves to him because there, then they would be Union slaves and he would be a Union slave owner and therefore his slaves would have to be returned to him. Well, uh, as you can imagine, this Confederate general does not go along with this. Um, and so Benjamin Butler at Fortress Monroe makes this policy, and then writes to his higher commands up in Washington, tells them what he's done, and the U.S. War Department officially approves the action and, in fact, makes it policy that uh, any slaves that run away and make their way to Union fortresses shall not be returned. One condition, these union, for, union forces are not allowed to entice slaves to run away, meaning they can't uh, invite them to run away. They can't like, you know, they can't encourage it. But if these slaves make their way to union battle lines, they will not be returned. They will be given asylum. And this precedent continues throughout the rest of the war. But now here's the issue. You have these former slaves who've run away. They have made themselves the issue in this war. They have made themselves a major portion of it, and they've run away. They've made it to these, these battle lines, but their status is not clear. They're, they're not slaves, but what are they? And so Butler labels them contraband of war. Butler labels them as contraband of war, no different than if, if the uh, Union forces conquered a Confederate stronghold and took their supplies, right? This, this idea that um, these slaves are essentially part of their supplies. They are contraband of the war. In the wake of their arrival at Fortress Monroe, uh, eight more slaves show up two days later, Four, more than 40 come the next day, and by August of 1861, a 1,000 enslaved people have arrived at Fortress Monroe. Fortress Monroe becomes known throughout the war as uh, Fortress Freedom, and they become not only part of the, the war effort, right? They've not only made themselves a focal point of this war, but they become part of the Union efforts. 
They become part of the union cause. And this is where it's important to understand this idea of self-emancipation theory or the self-emancipation thesis. That again, it wasn't Lincoln who freed the slaves. It wasn't the union that freed the slaves because had they fought the war the way they were fighting it, had it come to the conclusion it was likely to come to based on what they said were their, were their goals, slavery would not have been ended. But these enslaved people ran away, took them, took their lives into their own hands, came to the Union uh, fortresses, and demanded to be dealt with. What we see is 400 to 500,000 runaway slaves over the course of the war. They run away to Union lines, and they are declared free, but they aren't citizens yet. They're contraband, right? But this self-emancipation theory or the self-emancipation thesis, it corrects our tendency to ignore the powerless in the situation. We often ignore the role played by these formerly enslaved people. We Again, we ascribe this, this role as uh, the great emancipator to Lincoln. And the reality is that it's not Lincoln. Had Lincoln done uh, things his way from the beginning of the war, this wouldn't have been a thing. Now that said, over the course of this war, Lincoln is going to change. And one of the great uh, characteristics of Abraham Lincoln, right, he may not be the great emancipator, and that's okay. It doesn't take away from his role in history. It doesn't take away from who he was as a leader. Just because he's not the one who single-handedly ended slavery doesn't mean he didn't have a role. Lincoln, and one of the best qualities of Lincoln, is that Lincoln was willing to have his mind changed when he was presented with new information. Today, we are so uh, used to, to not being able to change our minds. When we talk about politics, when we talk about uh, religion, right, those topics we're not supposed to talk about at the dinner table, we're not supposed to talk about them for a reason because people become so entrenched in what they think and what they believe and they become unwilling to even consider that there's another way of looking at something. And when they're presented with evidence, they reject it because it's not the evidence they want to hear. It's not the evidence they want to see. Lincoln, Lincoln was willing, when presented with new evidence, with new information, Lincoln was willing to change his mind. And so by 1862, Lincoln is willing to now put out what is what we now refer to as the Emancipation Proclamation. Right, The initial Emancipation Proclamation or the Preliminary Emancipation Proclamation gets issued in September of 1862. It, lets the, the, it puts the entire country and the Confederacy on, on notice that on January 1st, 1863, any slaves, any slaves still being held in states or designated parts of a state where the, the people – are in rebellion against the United States, will be free. What does that mean? You can see the, the language there. What does that mean? The Emancipation Proclamation declares that as of January 1st, 1863, any person held in slavery in the Confederacy will be free. Now, you have to ask yourself, how can the President of the Union of the United States declare slaves in a foreign nation free. Again, this comes down to the issue of federalism. This comes down to the issue of uh, where you view the power truly lying, right? So those who would uphold the Emancipation Proclamation would say that the southern states never truly seceded, that they didn't have the authority to leave the Union, right? But what the Emancipation Proclamation does not do it does not free slaves in, in the Union. It does not free slaves in Union-held Confederate territory. So if the Union Army has taken land in the Confederate states, right, they're holding fortresses and whatnot, those slaves are not free. The Emancipation Proclamation, when it goes into effect, only frees about 3 million slaves. 
a million slaves are still left in bondage by the Emancipation Proclamation. And throughout the, throughout the world, the Emancipation Proclamation is viewed as weak. It's viewed as a cop-out. Again, Lincoln is freeing the slaves in territory he doesn't actually control. He's not even freeing the slaves in the territory he controls. But it's a major step. It's a major step in the evolution of Lincoln's thinking. By the end of the war in 1865, we will see that Lincoln has come from a position of he has no power over slavery to the Emancipation Proclamation where he said he could declare free the people held in those territories to now by the end of the war, Lincoln is going to say that a, 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 a piece, a major requirement of rejoining this union, of, of putting this union back together is going to be the ratification of the 13th Amendment, which will abolish slavery. After the Emancipation Proclamation, we start to see some shifts in the battle. Again, the starting with the uh, issue of slavery, that's a major turn in the battle. It's a major change in philosophy for the Union Army. The Union Army is no longer just fighting a war to uh, bring back these territories in rebellion. They are now fighting a war to end slavery and repair the Union and bring back these territories in rebellion. We're going to see a major shift in 1863 toward Union military triumphs, right? The Battle of Gettysburg in, in, in July, the Battle of Vicksburg in, in, uh, uh, still at the same time in July of 1863, right? These are major Union victories which turn the tide of the war and really contribute to Lincoln being reelected. He, he runs for, in the middle of this war, there's an election of 1864. Believe it or not, somebody runs against him, McClellan. Lincoln is going to win uh, reelection. Okay? He's going to win reelection in the middle of this war, which is key, right? Can you imagine if we were in the middle of a war, an active war like this, uh, on our, in our home, you know, country, on our turf, uh, and we have a change in president? Can you imagine what would have happened if we changed presidents in the middle? It would have changed the strategy. It would have changed uh, the tactic, right? But Lincoln is reelected, and in January of 1865, Congress is going to pass the language for the 13th Amendment. The states uh, in the Union will ratify the 13th Amendment to the Constitution, and the 13th Amendment declares that slavery is abolished. It is a clear demonstration. It is a clear demonstration of the changing racial climate in the North, different views towards race and, and this issue of slavery. The Thirteenth Amendment is is passed. And then the war really uh, begins to wind down. Sherman uh, General Sherman, as you can see here, William Tecumseh Sherman uh, is going to take and he is going to move from uh, Georgia. He's taking Georgia. He is going to push. His, his army is going to push uh, to the sea. They're going to push east to the sea. Sherman is not about uh, simple, just organized, elegant warfare. Uh, <laughs> Sherman is about total warfare, total destruction. And that is the, the policy shift that really uh, changes this war. When Grant and Sherman, when they, when they take up leadership within the Union forces, this becomes a total war. This becomes all out uh, destruction. And eventually between Sherman marching east and then pushing north, uh, the Union is going to surround the south. They're gonna cut off uh, Lee's forces. And Lee is going to be forced on April 9th, 1865. General Lee is going to be forced to surrender to General Grant at McLean House in Appomattox Courthouse. Appomattox Courthouse is a is a place. It's not a it's a city a town. It's not a it's not the name of where they were. They were at McLean House in Appomattox Courthouse. On this day, April 9th, 1865, the war is over.
sort of. We will study uh, in the end of the war, uh, the actual end of the war in other places like Texas later. But the major portion of this war is over. But only five days later, Abraham Lincoln is assassinated. And this is where we're going to stop for today. We'll pick up part three uh, in our next lecture. But the war ends, and not five days after that, Lincoln is assassinated. And we'll find out what's going to happen. How is the country going to repair itself? We'll talk about that next time. Thank you.